These numbers, what do they, uh, what's up with them? They've always intrigued me ever since I first saw them. Especially the eight, I always thought it looked like a tiny bottle of fancy perfume. And I guess I always assumed that they look kind of weird because, well, they're in some sort of machine readable format. And okay, yeah, that is the reason. But there's a bit more to the story, and I think it's one worth telling. My name is Eric, and this is episode one of Cool and Interesting. Although checks, in some form, have been in use since the dawn of banking, it was in America's post-World War II economy that their use really started to take off. And although the checks used at this time bear some resemblance to the ones we know today, the whole checking system worked quite a bit differently. Accounts were stored on paper ledger cards and kept in filing cabinets. And the only thing that verified a check as valid was your signature matching the one on file at the bank. Checks had to be manually sorted and processed, and account balances updated by hand, assisted only by the most primitive of mechanical adding machines. The process was slow and labor-intensive, so slow that to avoid having potentially millions of dollars in uncleared funds on their books, large banks would have to close at 2 or 3 in the afternoon, leaving them with enough time to process that day's checks, and leaving us with the lasting stereotype of bankers' hours. Well, 2 o'clock, I'll put my hour in. That's quitting time. Though it seems dated now, the system was, for its time, fairly well established and coordinated. Its one fatal flaw, however, was in scaling. In the years following the war, the number of checks written in the U.S. per year doubled from 4 billion in 1943 to over 8 billion in 1952, and banks were struggling to keep up. The costs required to hire enough people to process all these new checks began to eat into their bottom lines. And the largest commercial bank at the time, the Bank of America, who in 1945 controlled over $5 billion in assets, figured out that expanding their check processing capabilities would begin to cost them more than it was worth. The bank's barrier to future expansion was logistical. So in 1950, with the nightmarish thought of not being able to control the next $5 billion of the American economy in mind, two B of A executives fell in with the Stanford Research Institute, later just SRI, in Menlo Park, California. The two institutions found a shared vision for an automated future of banking, some way, some machine, that could process checks and update account balances automatically, at a speed no human could ever come close to matching. The project was greenlit, given a budget and a name, the Electronic Recording Machine, or ERM. Later, an A would be appended for accounting, leaving the acronym at the oddly pleasant IRMA. After a brief feasibility study, and likely helped by B of A's deep pockets, SRI concluded that such a machine could be built using the technology of the time, but that significant changes would have to be made to both the checks and the checking system. SRI explained that, first, accounts could no longer be represented by signatures stored in filing cabinets. Instead, each account would have to be given a unique number, and that number would have to somehow be encoded on the check in a way that machines could understand. This worried Bank of America, who feared that drastic changes to their checks would spook its customers, and the whole project would end up a net loss. The bank eventually conceded that account numbers would be a necessary change, but made it very clear to the SRI engineers that they couldn't alter the appearance of the check too much. The challenge then facing SRI was not trivial. Their solution had to be robust enough to read account information off a piece of paper which fit even the most liberal definition of a check, all without significantly changing its appearance and doing so using pre-transistor era technology. SRI first experimented with encoding account information using punched holes, 
which were deemed to be too fragile. Then UV fluorescent ink, which had the advantage of being invisible to the end user, but this proved to be a double-edged sword. The ink was easily obscured by stray marks and stamps. So they turned to magnetic ink, which when printed on a check and magnetized could be read using a pickup not unlike those found in a tape recorder. The ink was durable, cheap, and it solved the problem of stray marks and stamps. It could be read right through them. The bank was none too happy the ink would now be visible, but SRI saw it as the best solution and forged ahead with a prototype which encoded account information on the back of checks using a series of lines printed in magnetic ink. Kind of an early precursor to the modern day barcode. And this might well be what our checks look like today, if an idea from an engineer named Ken Eldridge didn't spur a last minute change. His idea was this. Take the same magnetic ink and use it to print standard Arabic numerals. Then run the pickup over the ink and analyze the resulting waveform to figure out what the numbers were. It was quite simple in theory. The pickup would produce a voltage proportional to the strength of the magnetic field under it at a given time. So as it was run over a number where there was more ink, the field would be stronger and the voltage higher. Where there was less ink, the voltage would be lower. The resulting waveform could then be sampled, converted into a string of binary, and further analyzed to decode what the original account number was. The system was a fair compromise. The encoding scheme would now be visible to the end user, but in a way that was much more tangible and familiar than the strange black bars of before. The bank was happy, SRI was happy, and Ken Eldridge was awarded the ceremonial 3 millionth US patent for his invention. Interestingly enough, this patent was awarded jointly to Eldridge and General Electric, not SRI or B of A as you might expect, but that is a story for a different video. All that was left to do now was retrofit the current IRMA with this new system, dubbed Magnetic Ink Character Recognition, or MICR. For this, Ken did what any good senior engineer would do, and gave the project to a PhD student named Philip Merritt, who not only led the effort to design and implement the system logic, but also designed the font used to print the numbers. Merritt and his team came up with a font that made the waveforms produced by the numbers as unique as possible, while still keeping them readable to humans, leaving us with the stylized numbers we know today, along with a few special symbols to denote the routing number, account number, and the amount on the check. And on September 22, 1955, Irma was unveiled to the public. 400 square feet of vacuum tubes and diodes, the machine had enough memory to process 50,000 checking accounts and a high-speed paper sorter that could do 2,000 checks a minute. The only human interaction needed was keying in the amount on the check. Everything else, from updating account balances, checking for holds and overdrafts, and even printing out statements to be mailed out each month was automatic. And by the mid-1960s, the system had become the new norm. People had gotten used to personalized personal checks with their new account numbers printed in a funny-looking font along the bottom. And the whole system worked. MICR and its analogs developed in other countries allowed the financial sector to keep up with the exploding global economy. And today, more than 65 years later, the same font and the same magnetic pickup waveform analysis process are still the primary method banks use to sort and process checks. Though the readers which once filled a room with cabinets of vacuum tubes are now reduced to solid state devices which fit in the palm of your hand. It really is a testament to how clever and forward thinking the idea Eldridge and the team at SRI came up with. But even then, it is not long for this world. There now exists a generation which may very well live their whole lives without ever writing or cashing a personal check. Hell, even the plastic cards that eclipsed these things are slowly being replaced with contactless payments on smartphones and online transactions. And who knows, maybe in another 65 years, fiat currency altogether will be replaced with a trustless ledger of blockchain hashes. Or not. But either way, Miker and the people who created it will soon likely fade to time, joining floppy disks and phone handsets as relics, symbols, their origins and makers forgotten. 
It can often make me feel existential, thinking about how quickly even a legacy as clever and influential as the one discussed here can fade to time. Overwritten by new ideas from people whose perspectives now we can't even begin to imagine. It is a human trait, some would argue the quintessential human trait, to worry about our legacy, this aspect of us that continues after we are gone. And I guess it's a story like this that can highlight just how fleeting legacies can be. But maybe that's okay. I would wager that few among us can remember much about the first person who decided to write something down, to record their experience. And regardless of that, we still feel the effects of their idea today, tied to them with an invisible string that stretches back through the fog of time. The things we typically think about when recalling legacies, our names and statues, stories. These are impermanent, ephemeral things, limited by the capacities of human memories and interests. But there is another aspect of legacy that has quite the opposite problem. It persists whether we want it to or not. Our ideas and actions today, no matter how small or insignificant they may seem, will be not overwritten but built upon by those who come after us. So that just by existing, by doing, well, anything. We leave a permanent, irreversible mark, not on the past, but on the future. So the next time you look at a check, if ever, you can see these funny looking numbers and now you'll know why they look the way they do. And you can think about the story and the people behind them. But if you forget a detail or can't remember a name, well, don't worry about it too much, and take it easy.